All right, let's talk about different types of applications and how we handle data. And let's talk a little bit about um, how we access the data. We have different data applications and technologies when we look at this list here. We have a concept called a distributed application. Now in a distributed app, you basically have more than one computer working on something. And typically what that is, is my workstation, the client, connects to a server to get some data out of it. Rather than me asking the server to do everything, I'll do some of the work and the server can then do some of the work. So the application itself is distributed between a client front end and a server back end. And so maybe on my client side, some checks on the data can be run, some sanity checks to make sure that I'm not trying to put letters into a zip code field or, or something like that. Just some, some basic things can be done. Maybe the data can be checked, it, it can be um, organized some way, and then I send it over to the server side, which stores the data, retrieves something, whatever. So decide the, the concept of distributed app, the client and the server are working together and you have like two, you have the front end and the back end of an application. Then we have this concept called web services and web-based applications. So much of what we create and how we access data is web-based. You might not necessarily even use a browser, but you're um, basically hitting a website because websites are so uh, very versatile. And like if you work in organizations, uh, even relatively small ones, you're, you're probably using an intranet website of some kind or you're using some kind of website. Larger organizations, they'll use SharePoint sites or whatever so that we can do team collaboration together. And it, it's just web front ends and web services so commonly in use and being used more and more and more. And um, I mean, I've been in um, uh, on projects where uh, teams had to very rapidly develop something and they found that using web protocols and web services was the quickest way to deliver this application and the quickest way to have this application just start working. So you can have a web server, obviously you're going to involve your infrastructure team because they're going to be setting up the web server, be it a virtual server or a physical box. They're going to install the operating system and whatever the web service is, Apache or um, uh, IIS or whatever it is, and they're going to put your application on that web server. Or they're going to put whatever um, web-based web, web application on that web server, whatever is required. So you're, it's not just going to be the developers, but you're also going to have the infrastructure team as well working with you. So web services and web-based applications, extremely popular, extremely common. There are whole disciplines to managing the security of websites and web-based applications and making sure that um, processes that, that receive this in input from a browser or even some little front end that doesn't look like a browser but still uses HTTP or HTTPS, that um, the, these processes run in their own separate um, memory pools and that they can be killed and then they can be managed and recycled. And so there's a whole, uh, you'll need your infrastructure team to be working with you to make sure that the, uh, if you do web-based applications that it runs properly. And the, realize that the website itself is just usually a front end. It doesn't have the data at all. The data is in a back end in some kind of database, like a SQL version database. And then there are tons of different versions of SQL. You, know, you have Oracle Transact, MySQL, you have Sybase SQL, all these different Microsoft and, and Oracle and, and the free versions and the open source. But anyway, you're going to have a lot of moving parts working. And there are security issues with all these moving parts. Could a web-based application basically hack the, uh, the web server? Could I supply um, malicious input to the web application and there was no contingency to handle that malicious input and the thing either goes crazy, there's a denial of service, it stops working, or it starts executing the code when it shouldn't be, the malicious code I've sent, or is it browsing around? I mean, back, back in the glory days of Windows 2000, uh, you could at a command prompt, basically, or, or in, a, in a browser, you could basically have a um, IIS server do all kinds of things, including show you everything on that server, download and execute code. I mean, it, it was just amazing, and nobody ever thought of it. Microsoft, of course, patched it up, but um, 
that, that just goes to show that there are security issues with, with everything, and especially with web services and, and a, a SQL server, which is probably on a whole different box, and the communication between the web server and the SQL server, is that secure? How does the web server log on to the SQL server to get the data? So the, that's why the security people need to also be involved with the infrastructure people in all phases to, to look for potential security holes and security issues. And then we have this concept called N-tier applications. So like if I have a web front end, I'll have some little program here, and it could be browser-based, or it uses HTTP in the background, even though it doesn't seem to be browser-based. And then I hit a, a, a web front end, which just basically accepts my um, input. It consumes my input. And it has a little application that runs and does something to the input. And then the web front end, again, is just the, the thing that interfaces with me, the user. Um, then maybe I'll have business logic. Like, so basically I, I want to uh, order something or I want to get something from a database. Well, the web front end will then have another tier or another layer that runs business logic like, okay, you can do this, but only under these conditions. Or uh, we're going to um, uh, do something to the data. So like, for example, I want an application that can show me across all markets certain trends. And I want to be able to slice and dice as I go. So maybe my front end, my, my client app, I can set my requirements. And then the, the web front end receives the requirements here. The database is simply the raw warehousing of the data. So then I'll have a middle tier, or an end, and you can have n means any number of. So I have another application between the web service and the database. You know, where it's physically housed, probably on the database server, it could be a separate box, probably on the database server, maybe on the web server, that basically then goes and looks at specific databases and specific tables and crunches all of that based on the criteria. So you can spread this whole thing out and you usually offload the, the business logic for like all the search onto something different and maybe the business rules. So that's the idea behind N tier. Now when we're developing systems and software, there are a number of develop development mechanisms ones that have been around for a very long time and ones that are relatively new. They all have their pluses and minuses. Something that so many organizations are moving to is something called agile development. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in just one second. But it's something that we've been moving a lot to. And um, I can tell you that um, in, in some of my um, situations, uh, I have seen where we couldn't get a major release out to save our lives until we went to an agile development and it allowed us to get the major release out. Uh, there's also prototyping, where as the, the name implies, we just simply create a prototype. Do you like it? Okay, let's tweak it. Here's another prototype. Do you like it? Here's another one. Do you like it? There's rapid application development, which basically is we favor minimal planning and prototyping as opposed to big, long, complex uh, requirements gathering and planning of a classic uh, SDLC. There's data-oriented system development where customers will want to be able to access data. And it's typically done to a database of some kind, like some kind of SQL database. And then there's object-oriented design. And with object-oriented design, um, rather than you just access the data directly, you access the data. It's, it's bundled up in something called an object. And it could be a user object, client object, um, you know, this uh, stock inventory, some, some kind of object. Uh, um, and if you want to get into the, the data of that object, you have to call functions called methods. These are basically um, actions, things that you can, they, they act as an intermediary to get to the data. And they're bundled up, these, these, um, these descriptions, these attributes, and the data and the, uh, the methods are all bundled up into something called an object. And you can reuse the objects. And you can have um, different instances of the same object. Like the, the user class, uh, you can have um, like uh, user objects, OK? And usually objects come from like a, a class. So I can have a user class, and then I can have individual user objects. So I can have all of these uh, logons for individual users. And they each have their own um, 
uh, attributes and their own uh, data inside of them, and I call these different methods, these functions, to get into the data about that user that I want. So these are different development methods and tools. And let's take a closer look. Next thing we're going to talk about is a little bit more how Agile actually works.